Again, good morning. Turn to 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 2. 1 Samuel 2, I'll read verses 12 through 17. 1 Samuel 2, 12 and following. Now the sons of Eli, Eli was a judge and priest of God, had a very special position, were corrupt. Corrupt means they were just not right. They were crooked. They were dishonest. Some believe that word means immoral. Just that far gone spiritually. They did not know the Lord. Now that doesn't mean they had not heard of the Lord. They did not have a relationship. They lacked lack knowledge of Him, respect and reverence for Jehovah God. And the priest's custom, and this would have to do with these sons, with the people that when any man offered a, offered a sacrifice, the priest's servant, they would send him, would come with a three-pronged flesh hook in his hand while the meat was boiling some of it would be reserved for the priest, the thigh and the breast, and the rest and the fat would be devoted to God. Then he would take it, this three-pronged flesh hook, thrust it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot, and the priest would take for himself all that the flesh hook brought up, which would typically be more than what God had commanded for them to have in Leviticus chapter 7. So they did in Shiloh to all the Israelites who came there. Also, before they burned the fat, which was commanded by God, the priest's servant, again they sent him, would come and say to the man who sacrificed, give meat for roasting to the priest. In other words, before you boil it, just give some that the priest can have. For he will not take boiled meat from you, but raw. And these sons of Eli intended to just roast the beef, or I'm sorry, the meat for themselves. And if the man said to him, they should really burn the fat first, then you may take as much as your heart desires, he would then answer them, no. But you must give it now. And if not, I will take it by force. Therefore, the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord, for men abhorred the offering of the Lord. By the way, who's the men that abhorred the offering? It's not the sons. It's the people who are bringing the offerings because they saw that things were not right according to God's word. So men actually got to where they didn't want to bring their meat because they knew it would not be used in the way God had commanded the young men, the two young men mentioned in the story, were named Hophni and Phinehas. And if abusing the sacrificial offerings to God, which was so, so special, was not bad enough, in verse 22 of the same chapter, at the end of the verse, it says, they lay with women, they're talking about sex, who assembled at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. In other words, they used their status, their position, uh, or perhaps the promise of special favors in exchange for sex with these women, probably young virgin women. As a result of this sin, God caused both of these young men to be killed on the same day by the idolatrous Philistines, as recorded in 1 Samuel 4 and verse 11. Now, what is particularly tragic about this story is that their father, Eli, was such a devoted man of God. How could the sons of a man so devoted to God turn out that way? Well, the Bible gives us a hint. In 1 Samuel 2 and verse 25, it says that they did not heed the voice of their father. So their father knew what they were doing. And he was upset. And he was trying to tell them, don't do this anymore. This is wrong. This is sinful. You're violating the will of God. You're you're taking the priesthood and making it a horrible thing before the people. So he told them, obviously, what he felt, but that was just a problem. He just told them. In fact, in chapter 3, chapter 3 of 1 Samuel, verse 13, at the end of that verse, it says, his sons made themselves vile 
just the opposite of being holy, and did not restrain them. He never tried to stop them. Do you know, according to the law of Moses, he could have had both of his sons executed, or at least punished severely, but he never did. His bark was definitely worse than his bite. In fact, he had no real bite at all. (coughs) Folks, think about it. If young children are hollered at, screamed at, so told, stop this, don't quit, come back here, and never are compelled to do so, they'll do what they want, and so were these two boys. It was as much Eli's fault as theirs, okay? Goes without saying, we want a lot better for our children, don't we? What do we want as Christian parents? Think about it, for our children. Well, we want them to learn from the Bible all about God and Jesus and heaven and hell and the church and God's plan to save us. We want them as they grow older, where they become old enough to sin, that they would know enough about God at that time that they would say, you know what, I need to obey the gospel of Jesus. I need to not only believe in Jesus, I need to repent, I need to confess my faith, I need to be immersed, baptized into the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of my sins and walk, continue to walk after Jesus Christ. We want them then to become strong Christians and bright lights for Jesus. And if they are so inclined to marry, to marry Christians and to raise Christian families and to stay faithful and one day be in heaven. I think that's what most all Christian parents want. But the question is, well, how do we help ensure that that's how it turns out? The real answer is found in Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6. Proverbs 22, verse 6, many of you know it. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he'll not depart from it. Now let's just break that down. The word train means to teach, to instruct, to model, or demonstrate. Up means the process of growing. You teach them beginning at the youngest age possible all the way through, certainly their lives at home, and hopefully beyond when you have the opportunity. The way he should go, spiritually speaking, in the ways of God, the command, the laws of God. In other words, if we continually train our children in the ways of God from the time they're very, very young, chances are, chances are, they'll grow up to be exactly what we would want them to be, faithful Christians. But let's just go back to that word train. Train, that's the operative word here. And there's two important aspects to that word. Number one is to teach or verbally instruct, to tell, to reveal. The Bible talks about that from start to finish. For instance, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, you might want to turn there. Deuteronomy chapter 6, I'll read verses 6 and 7. This is Moses talking to the people, and God told Moses to do this. And these words, which I command to you today, that sounds familiar. Lester, I think you said something about that. Shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently. Diligently means continually, steadily, and with emphasis to your children. And shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You will talk to your children about the Lord and His laws and His commands and His warnings as well. One of my favorite verses to show you the character of Abraham is found in Genesis chapter 18, verse 19. God, apparently speaking to the Godhead, all of him, said this about Abraham. God says, For I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him that they keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice. I know this man will teach his children and will teach them well, in other words. God shared a lot with Abraham for that reason, not only that reason, but that was one of the reasons. David wrote in Psalms 145, verse 4, One generation shall praise your works to another, to the next generation coming up, and shall declare your mighty acts. They'll teach their children 
and those children will teach theirs. In Isaiah chapter 38, verse 19, Isaiah said, The Father shall make known your truth to the children. And in the New Testament, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4, Fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training. That would be the instruction and admonition. That would be the warnings of the Lord. Teaching. Teaching. Verbally instructing. That's a big part of training, but there's another part. The other aspect is means to model, model, to demonstrate. We have many examples of this. The greatest example of all, Jesus, being the model, the demonstrator to his disciples. And one of the greatest examples of all was just before his death, just before his betrayal. I'm reading from John chapter 13. If you want to turn there, John chapter 13. I'll start at verse 12. At this point in the reading, Jesus has just washed the dirty, filthy, smelly feet of his disciples, his apostles. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments, and had sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I've done to you? I'm sure they're thinking, Of course, what are you talking about? He explains, you call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If then I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash another's feet. For, here's the point, I have given you an example that you should do as I've done to you. Unlike the Pharisees and scribes who said but didn't do, Jesus did. And so commanded, as Paul, or I'm sorry, as, uh, um, um, oh, my mind really is gone today. You'll, you'll have Joe Campbell taught in his class this morning. All right, now let's just look at a couple of other, other examples. The Apostle Paul talked about the importance of showing the way, not just saying, not just teaching, but showing it. In Acts chapter 20, verse 35, Paul was writing to elders from Ephesus, and he said this, he said, I have shown you. You've you've seen what I've done in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak. Do you know how the Apostle Paul supported the weak? He's an itinerant missionary, all right? Because in most places he went, when he stopped there, when he wasn't talking to others about the gospel in the synagogue or some other place, he was working as a tent maker to earn money. But not just for his own keep, but to give to anyone poor in that area in addition to sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. He said, I've shown you. Do this. In fact, 1 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1, Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Jesus Christ. Do what I do, because I'm doing what Jesus did. 1 Thessalonians 1, verses 6 and 7. He says, you have become followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy in the Holy Spirit, so that you became examples. You become living demonstrations in all of Macedonia and Achaia who believe. To the young preacher Timothy, Paul said, be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, love, spirit, faith, and purity. 1 Timothy 4, verse 12. Similar words he gave to the young preacher Titus. Titus chapter 2, verse 7. In all things, showing yourself to be a pattern. That Greek word literally means a blueprint, a a model of good works. Now, although verbal teaching and showing, demonstrating are vital to training, I cannot overstress the importance of parents showing their children what following Christ is all about. Demonstrating day by day, what it is to be a Christian. After all, children, if we understand education, learn about 25 to 30 percent from what they hear. They learn 70 to 75 percent from what they see. 1983, I'll never forget, I was taught to skydive at the uh, uh, jump school in uh, Tecumseh. And they, 
through learning over the years, demonstrated, demonstrated in six hours what years before had taken 40 hours to teach. Because most of the learning way years before was done by verbal instruction mostly, and just a little bit of demonstration, but they learned if you mostly demonstrate, talk a little, demonstrate a lot, you can teach someone how to jump out of a properly working airplane in six hours and hit the ground without breaking a leg. With, of course, the aid of a parachute. Now, I remember one thing that they said in the course. They said, now, if you don't, now remember this, if you don't watch carefully, then we'll have to transfer you into the seven-second course. Of course, everybody looked at each other. What, what's a se seven-second course? That's where we take you up to 3,000 feet and we just push you out the door of the plane. And if your chute doesn't open in seven seconds, then your worries are over. <laughs> Except maybe for some, their worries would just start, right? Well, anyway, watching, demonstrating is so, so important. So if you really want to see how you're training your children, yes, what you say is important. But look at your life. Nothing will affect them as much as that. Look at your behavior, your habits, your speech, your interests, your priorities. So let me ask you this. Put it this way. We'll, 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 if, as if I'm speaking, or we were speaking to ourselves. Will I be happy if my children grow up to be just like me spiritually? Just for example. You remember what Jesus said in Matthew 4, verse 4, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Well, will you be happy if your children spend the same amount of time studying the Bible when they are adults, as you do right now? 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 17, Pray without ceasing. Will you be happy if your children stay, spend the same amount of time in prayer as you do when they're adults? Can you say, well, I would be very happy about that? Acts 2 verse 42 says about the early church, among those things they continued in was the apostles' doctrine. They had, as we would call them, Bible classes almost every day of the week. They needed to learn and were hungry to learn more about what God expected of his children in the church. Well, will you be happy if your children attend Bible classes as often as you do when they grow up? Hebrews 10, 25 tells us not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Well, will you be happy if your children attend worship services as often as you do when they grow up? Galatians 6, verse 10, as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Well, will you be happy if your children grow up and serve others as much as you do right now? Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Matthew 6, 33. Will you be happy if your children grow up seeking first, seeking first the same thing that you are seeking first right now? I guess the upshot of all this is, will your children, I'm sorry, if your children grow up to be just like you are, spiritually, how confident will you be when they stand before the judgment seat of God and Jesus Christ? Don't misunderstand. Every one of us as parents make mistakes. Many mistakes. No one's perfect. But here's the thing. If, if there's anything in your life right now as a father, mother, even grandparents, that you see is just not what you'd want your children or grandchildren to one day be, then change. Because you can. We all can. And thanks to the grace of God, He's patient enough with us that we can change. You remember something Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, beginning at verse 9. He said, What man is there among you who, if his son asks for bread, obviously the son being hungry, Dad, have a piece of bread. 
Who among you would give him a stone? Here. <laughs> no on that for a while. Or if he asked for a fish, we'll give him a serpent or a snake. And by the way, to the Jewish people, that was so unclean. It was, it'd make you unclean to touch a snake, let alone try to eat one. Let's pray about what our children need and what we need to give them. Thank you so much, Father, for every single one who's come to worship today. Bless us all as a result. And especially help us as parents, even if our children are grown and out of the house. And as grandparents also. To be the best demonstrators of the life of Jesus that we can be. And we've all fallen short. And you know I have. Just help us to do better for their sakes, and for the salvation of their souls. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. If there's someone here who needs to respond to the invitation, if you might need our prayers to be restored, if you've fallen away from the Lord, if you need our prayers for strength or for something going on in your life, but certainly if you've never obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, Jesus is waiting for you. The angels are waiting to rejoice. All you have to do is to make the decision today to give your life to Jesus. Confess your faith in Him. Repent and be baptized. And we'll be glad to help you with that if you decide to follow Jesus today. If you need to, would you come up and have a seat as those of us who can stand and sing the song together.